um, this panel is the Harnessing the Power of Social Media for Social Good panel. Oh. <laughs> Does someone have something to say? No? no. <laughs> is Siri, Siri is Siri yeah. getting involved in this situation? <laughs> All right. So welcome everybody. This is the Harnessing the Power of Media for Social Good panel um, hosted by Liquid Media Group. Uh, my name is Nancy Bassey. I'm one of the board of directors of Liquid. Um, really excited to be here um, since we are just launching um, some of our new initiatives. Um, but for this uh, this uh, talk, we want to talk about social change and how um, projects and things that we can make, um, how, to, how to get funding, how we can get messages out, and how the tides are turning, that people are not just looking for the blockbusters. They want and are very interested in human stories and stories that touch us and stories that um, have historical accuracy and things like that. So first, I'm just going to quickly introduce the panel so we all know who's talking. First, we have actor, producer, activist, and chairman of Liquid Media, Joshua Jackson. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Next to him is producer, writer, and CEO of iGEMS, John Fitzgerald. And oh, this is this is another long one. Director, producer, writer, and CEO of IndieFlix, Sheila Landrine. <laughs> Co-founder and chief product officer of Filmocracy, Kasia Kazimacic. Did I say that right? <laughs> I probably didn't, right? And last but not least, actor, designer, activist, storyteller, and self-described explorer, tea magnet of House of Weris, Weris Alualia. Welcome. Oh. <clears throat> so, Weris, I'd love to start with you um, because I'm I'm just yeah. fascinated by um, your social activism and your and your um, storytelling runs through not just movies and screens, but product and design. And I'd love to kind of know how, if possible, you started this journey into social impact and in everything you do. The well, good good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me here, first of all. Um, sorry, I can't physically be there with you. Uh, the, the, it, it started actually at an, at an early age, um, and I won't go back to childhood or anything like that for the story, but I, it, it started at an early age where I, was, I, I loved going out, and I loved having a good time and smiling and laughing, and I realized you, if you could embed something that that did some good in the middle of that, how, how ideal and how convenient that could be. And I, you know, I was studying in England and I threw a party called Love Life and it was at the student union and all the funds went to anti-racist causes. And this was back when I was 19. And from there, I sort of started developing that where it's always paired with, and, and as Josh can attest to, it's always paired with having a good time, but then, you know, and, and telling a great story and entertaining people. Uh, but sort of the, the simplest two words is Troj Trojan horse um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, bringing, you know, making that impact, making that change, bringing that, whatever, whatever that is, raising the money, uh, but doing it through smiles and laughter. That's fantastic. So how did you start uh, the journey to help save uh, the Indian elephants? Because I was reading that it was a 300 mile journey across India to build awareness. Your partner in crime was Josh. So we definitely want any of your uh, any of your roommate stories. Feel free to throw those in. We're, we're very interested. But uh, but fascinating um, planes, trains and automobiles. Uh, I will say that Warris is the only man I've slept in a bed with in my adult life. <laughs> <laughs> that you'll admit to. <laughs> so did you take me on that journey and, and and did you find funding for that or how did you get that supported? Absolutely. It's um it's all part of a that the the tra it's called Travels to My Elephant. And it it's it, it's all part of one of the the, the endeavors events um, that Elephant Family puts together. And Elephant Family is an organization based in the UK and I've I've been working with them for over a decade now and i think we have that similar alignment that there's this sort of what you know i am not a big fan of pulling on heartstrings there's you know in the, in that sense like you know the elephants are dying well i've got news for everyone i don't know if anyone knows we're all dying 
at some at some rate you know some faster some slower it's it's part of the human condition it's part of being alive you're and so instead of focusing on that let's focus on the the more celebratory uh moments of the of the life that we do have and and so that's where things like that travels to my elephant where we you know 500 kilometers across uh rural india to to raise awareness of the, the the plight of the elephant but without you know showing pictures of dead elephants that is definitely a way to that is definitely a way to do it but it, it's 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 simple it's too much sympathy and to you know it, it's it's more about this this idea of of how we can nurture and for the longer but i feel like the 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 pulling on the heartstrings or the the suffering is just more immediate and it's like right now versus when you we're, we're talking about creating longer term change in human in human nature so that's how we did it that's that's fantastic and the feedback i mean are you able to track any of the impact that 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 um, story had um I just got I just got uh, distracted by the the hand signals and I couldn't yeah. tell. <laughs> <laughs> Some, someone is singing opera somewhere in the building, and we're <laughs> we got it now. It was the shut the door signal. I got this, and I was like, I thought that was cut it short from. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, okay, and that's how we did it. <laughs> No, I was just curious on if if, it, if you were able to track any any of the impact that that story had. Absolutely, I mean, it was it would you know went across social media. We raised you know we raised considerable amounts of money over you know over a million pounds, and you're you're getting the conversation in with in with life. I think it's just sort of the uh, I'm, I'm ma making a lot of big statements here, but the. I don't. I, I don't love to approach, you know, this impact place of a place from victimhood, mm. sort of, which is which is what a lot of this, whether it's you know whether it's uh, environmental or it's or it's immigration or it's social justice, it, it's and, and I'd rather come at it from a place of empowerment um, and empower the people working with the elephants, empower people working, you know, doing the doing the good. And so yeah, we were able to track obviously the. The, the the media impact and and it was all over the press and then and then the social media impact obviously and the financial impact so it was it was a win 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 um and uh, and, and another win when you know Josh climbed into bed with me at three in the morning. <laughs> Speaking of which, so Josh, do you, I mean, you've been an activist for quite a while. You've worked with ocean issues, you've worked with elephant issues, but you've also chosen to make cho changes or choices with your career choices. So thinking of uh, doing feature films like, or a large, sorry, large form uh, projects like When They See Us. Yeah. So how did you get involved in that? And did you, did, and was it, did Ava DuVernay have a problem trying to get that main, you know, what was the feedback from from people who were funding it? I think, I mean, so I was brought in as, just as an actor on that one. And uh, so I wasn't around for the, the sausage making, but I know that she, they that story had existed for a long time. She had wanted to tell that story for a while. Um, and they definitely had difficulties trying to package it as a traditional film, um, partially because the story is too big to fit into 120 minutes, but, and partially because there's still, it's getting better, but there's still institutional resistance to um, telling those kinds of stories and doing to pick up on something that Wars was saying, even though when they see us is quite at times incredibly serious and heavy. Um, when you talk about t telling the story in, uh, you know, anywhere in, in to do with social justice or social impact, what he's talking about not coming from victimhood is actually centering the story and the people who the story is about, right? So uh, removing the great white hope uh, from a lot of these stories and recentering it on the people that are actually affected by the story that you're trying to tell. So that's one of the things that I think um, was a struggle for when they see us as it was moving its way towards finally getting in front of an audience is that it, it, there, there were no white heroes. And it's centered on the story of these these young these boys, children, who then became men. And so, to me, what I find so interesting about where where we're moving as an industry and where we're moving as an audience, really, is both a 
a recognition that we have have, have told only a very narrow portion, uh, broadly speaking, of the of the stories that are out there in the world, and that we have often centered the wrong people in those stories, um, and we've made those narratives more convenient to mainstream, but which means white. We've made those those stories more convenient to to white audiences rather than giving. Uh, the proper platform to the stories that are trying to be told. All of which is to say that I think we live in a very interesting time because something like When They See Us, you know, uh, is not a documentary and is allowed to live inside of a, a sort of a new old format. A four, it's four, Do you mind telling everybody what, what this, just briefly what the story oh, is the, about so, in case yeah. they don't know? So it's the, the story <laughs> of the um, Central arrest, Park Five. trial and ultimate exoneration of the Central Park Five, who were uh, railroaded as teenagers, as children, um, accused of a crime that they did not commit, that they demonstrably did not commit, but the powers that be inside of the NYPD and then ultimately the district's attorney office just decided that these uh, five young black and brown kids had to do it because they were black and brown. And it's as awful as that sounds. And, and um, it took some of them a couple of years to cycle out of the system and it took i think the longest incarcerated was i think he's in for 11 years um yeah. and ultimately was only finally exonerated because of an accident of history the man who actually committed the crime uh was imprisoned with him for a different crime and saw him in there and and confessed realizing that this young well now man was um was in crime or in prison for a crime he didn't commit so it, it's a incredibly difficult, ultimately a very uplifting story because the story of these men and their unwillingness to bow under the pressure of the system is truly inspiring. But it also, when we talk about the, you know, when, when we're up here talking about how we can have impact and be of impact in the world, Ava structured this thing, centered the story, told essentially four one hour movies, even though it's called a mini series. And then because she had a platform like Netflix, it goes out to the entire planet and is able to have a tremendous impact where if it had found a life as an independent film 10 years earlier, the avenues for its distribution and the, the it's almost certain that it would not have been able to find the amount of eyeballs that it found and it really changes the conversation. Um, and so to me, that is the future of our business. I mean, I, I don't want to talk myself out of a job, but I think that there is we are learning that there is more appetite from the audience to center people in front of the camera who have not traditionally been centered, to expand the amount of people or, the, or non-traditionally centered people behind the camera, the, the, the writers, the directors, the producers. And we are living in an era where, because of online platforms, these things can be um, not just festival darlings that are known inside of our community and, and, and we all get to appreciate but can actually be seen by massively broad audiences and the audiences continue to tell us that this this is what they want to see that 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 yeah there's space for men in tights and marvel movies and all the rest of that and and popcorn movies are great but audiences c continue to seek out and find and demand uh stories like this that that are centering people who have been left out of the narrative before and speak directly to social impact, whatever the, the cause may be. Right. And Sheila, you have tapped into this for quite some time, this human story, um, emotional, deep, um, deep feeling kind of story. And you're seeing more and more uptake on that. Can you talk about some of the projects you've done and how they've been able to spin out into other things? Sure. Um, again, unplanned uh, in my journey, I across a little film that was about bullying and I'd seen it as a rough cut. They were looking for finishing funds. It really resonated with me because I was really bullied. I grew up in a small mining town in Colorado when I was younger and I was the only kid of color. And um, so when I saw this film, the first thing I wanted to do was to talk to somebody, but there was no one to talk to in my living room. <laughs> so I thought, I'm just going to test this for a minute. And I took it up to my kid's school and showed it to the whole sixth and seventh grade. And in 90 minutes, we transformed the conversation around bullying in that school. And I was so ill-prepared and I just thought, oh my gosh, like we have to figure out how to go to another school and do some more testing. And literally within 24 hours, we had about four or five schools calling us and they wanted marketing materials and they wanted conversation discussion guides and they wanted all these things. It was like, and then, you know, 
there was so much to put together to take it out into schools. And that kind of kicked us off into creating more content for schools. And then they were saying, that was amazing. What else have you got? So we needed to suddenly feed the dragon and um, create more content. And it couldn't be too woo woo because then the schools wouldn't take it. Um, and then I got involved with, uh, so, so you define woo woo. Woo woo. Like, so, uh, um, <clears throat> we stuck with science. We stuck okay. with hard facts. We, things that could be taught in schools, things that would not be religious or political or, you know, very sort of very clean. And then a friend of mine came to me and said, you know, you need to make a movie about mental health. You're in thousands of schools. You're reaching so many students. You need to make a movie about mental health. And I was like, no, I'm not touching that. I'm just a filmmaker. I don't know anything about that. And I don't think anyone would want to talk about mental health. <laughs> and um, she actually worked with me. Uh, so I saw her every week. And then uh, I got the call on New Year's morning that she died by suicide. Oh. Being two teenage children and a husband. And I knew she was struggling, but I didn't know to that degree. So I remember it was in Seattle. I was looking out the dining room window. It was a cold, blustery morning. And I just thought, okay, I'm going to make a movie about mental health. I have no idea what that looks like. I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know that it's going to be filled with hope. And I'm, I, we, I'm going to learn about it. So I just sort of dove on into the deep end and made Angst, which is a documentary about anxiety and depression. And it had to be filled with science and hope. But, you know, some of the things that really help our brains and our and, and to address mental health is talking about it and meditation and mindfulness and all these wonderful free tools. Well, you, it's hard to take that into the school. And Loris, what you were saying, like, let's not focus on the victim side. Let's focus on the positive. Let's model the new paradigm. Let's hide the broccoli in the shake. And, <laughs> and, and so, so that's what we started to do and just, really focus on that. And I just got some incredible people. And I don't even know how this happens. Like I just would ring up someone and say, I heard you were like the person I should talk to. Could I film you? I'm making this. Okay. How about Tuesday at four? Okay. You know, like it was, I didn't even have to like send stuff. I didn't realize uh, people want to talk about this. However, when the film was done, it took seven or eight months before school would book it. And kids were dropping like flies, mm. dying by suicide. They only had one counselor. So they're like, oh, we know it's a problem, but if we open up the conversation, we're not prepared yeah. to deal with it. Yeah. So then it's like, they're like, how can you help us? I'm like, I, I, I don't even know how it's testing. Like no one's watching it. Um, I don't know if it's triggering. I don't know if it's going to, you know, create a problem. And then all the ugly start to come out, like the principals who say, well, we don't want every kid to catch it. And it's like, it's not a cold. <laughs> and when a kid yeah. says, I have anxiety, they're not looking to get out of something. They're looking for help to get through it. Yeah. And I'd learned that in making the film. But I realized that information wasn't out there. So how do you take in a tough conversation, get people talking about it, when our whole lives we've been taught not to talk about it? Some cultures more than, more than others. So uh, it was really interesting. And you know, a few schools started to show it and we started to get some data on the fact that it was not triggering and then more schools and more schools. And then all of a sudden it was like, we couldn't even field all the calls. And suddenly we were like, I'm sure like George Clooney is a doctor in ER would go through the airport and people would say, I hurt right here. What do you think? <laughs> suddenly people were saying to us, so my kid is, you know, cutting and not eating. We need that movie. What should we do? And it's like, you need to go to a doctor. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and so then we realized people want to know what's the first thing they should do after they watch the movie. If you're not sure, number one question, how do I know someone has anxiety or an actual anxiety disorder? Mm. We talk about it throughout the whole movie, but it was the number one asked question. Yeah. So like we learn all these things, gather the information, spit it back out and share it. And it just keeps evolving and We'll make an announcement probably later next week, but uh, we're actually going to be going statewide with the mental health programs that we have. And they're just movies, mm -hmm. but we're going to be going through and showing it in every public and charter school. So um, there's opportunity to, well, another one, sexual harassment, and then I'm going to cut myself off. Nobody wants to watch that, even though everybody knows we need to watch it. Mm -hmm. But there's, and I'll say this openly because I'm challenging mm -hmm. corporate leadership there is no courage in leadership right now. Do not be afraid to bring these films 
these conversations into the workplace and into our schools. We need to have these conversations and we need to learn from each other because there's no magic bullet or elixir that we just haven't paid for yet and implemented into our culture to then have the conversation. We need to start having the conversations and make these safe spaces to grow and learn from each other. We have to wear that itchy sweater. That's the, yeah. We have to wear that itchy sweater until it's not itchy anymore. So, Kasia, for Filmocracy, you guys are actually wanting this type of content, correct? Like you, you do want to create film festivals and give opportunities for people to see more opportunity for people to see these these yeah. projects. And and we are already doing that, uh, but we want to do more of that. That's uh, that's why we are now developing our project Filmocracy for Change. And one of the things that we're doing as part of that is really helping festivals that address that social impact to develop. And, you know, Sheila, you started talking about, about schools and about kids. And one of the things that I am very passionate about are festivals that are for for teenagers and by teenagers, you know, actual movies that are created by kids about change mm -hmm. and about their problems. And, and we actually hosted a few, um, which is so important because it's one of the thing, it, things is to, you know, create content, um, disseminate knowledge, but it's also about empowering empowering those kids to be future activists, to show them that they can make a change. And, um, and also another thing for a streaming platform that we are, right? We want to be cultivating audiences. We want those teenagers to, be, to take part in film festivals, right? So, um, so this, is, this is very important for us. We are launching now um, a program, kind of a film festival accelerator when we have 10 film festivals from all around the world and we help them grow, we help them reach the audiences they want to, but also refine their programming. And we're making sure that social impact festivals are prioritized in that program. And everything's online, so access mobile devices, yeah. any screen can, yeah. can watch. Them. And this is also another thing that's so important because internet is the great equalizer. You know, like, obviously, people, you who are here in Toronto, you are able to be here in Toronto. But there are a lot of people around the world that are not, right? And Including we want... Including one of our panelists. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, you know, for, for different, different reasons. And, and um, independent film is so niche also for this reason that it's kind of cultivated in big cities with with people that have access, but there are much more people that could benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so John, you were an, an early con convert to the impact filmmaking um, space, not only uh, b making movies and documentaries, but you decided to write a book about it. Can you talk a little bit about that? You're a pioneer. Yeah. <laughs> legendary pioneer. Wow. Oh, legendary. Pioneer. Those, <laughs> are, those are big words. <laughs> big words. Icon. Um, well, no, I, I think what's interesting about, um, this evolution that we're seeing everybody up here has kind of touched on it but if you if you if you start with the festival circuit and you look at at sundance and hot docs and and a lot of these festivals it is these social impact movies that are making all the noise it's it's what people really want to see and and you start looking at films that have won oscars it's been happening for a long time but people haven't really called it out and i was literally showing one of my social impact movies at a film festival, and why is this sound funny? You guys hearing You're feedback? Getting feedback, yeah. Um, I'll lean forward. Maybe that'll make a difference. Uh, I, I was showing a film at a festival, and I was on a panel with the publisher Michael Weesey, and um, I asked him why they didn't have a book about social impact, and he said, "Well, we need one." So I pitched him an idea, and. A week later, I was writing this book. But the whole idea that, that struck me was as a festival programmer, I was seeing thousands of movies, right? And I started gravitating towards the idea of social impact movies and how movies can create change. And so I made a few of those documentaries. I did one about breastfeeding, of all things. I know a lot more than a lot of women about breastfeeding. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I learned, I dove into the subject because we needed to restore the, the, the nursing mother and the phenomenon that, that was dying. Um, America has, I think, 15% success rate at breastfeeding through you know the, the, the traditional time period of 
10 months or something. Oh, that's low. But anyway, yeah, it was bad. But, but what I found interesting was following the lead of participant media, right? And Food Inc. and The Cove and some of these amazing documentaries. And what I learned was, and I put this in the book, is that, yes, there's the educational content, but there's also narrative storytelling that we're seeing in documentary. And so I started researching and I realized that Joseph Campbell's hero's journey and the 12 stages of the journey, you could take those ideas and put them into a documentary structure with beginning, middle and end, but there's, you know, the crossing the threshold and, and the allies and call to adventure and all these things. So if you could take these creative ideas in a social impact format, put them into a documentary with a narrative structure, then it becomes more entertaining, right? So you can, you can create change by entertaining. I mean, the code was like a thriller, mm. right? Yeah. And yeah. so if you, can, if you can take these important movies that can move the needle, Food, Inc. has changed the diet for millions of people. They've, they've done empirical studies on it. You can all go to the, the Participant Media Index and see the, the studies. Spotlight won the best, best picture Oscar, right? That's, that's a social impact movie. So I think we're seeing more of these entertaining documentary and narratives that have social impact without beating people over the head with the message, but they're entertaining through change. We, you know, what's interesting to me about that idea. So we, we somewhere along the line, this idea of what we now call social impact or social justice, it, we, it got a bad name. Like it has to be medicine, mm -hmm. right? Because what we're really, what you're talking about there is you're talking about creating culture which is what the entertainment industry has always done from the very beginning, right? If you show uh, Leave it to Beaver and you show that that's the typical structure of a family, you're creating culture that in its way is a social impact television show. Mm -hmm. and, and we inside of this community, every story that we tell has a framing inside of the culture that it, that it exists in. And so I, I'm, I, I don't know where we got off track, where we where we started to think like, well, if it has a message, it must be boring or bad or uninteresting, where all of the like the most thrilling things that we've ever watched, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. They are, they're all social impact movies because they're giving you a frame of the culture that you either live in now, may live in the future or have lived in in the past. And I think we're getting back to that now, recognizing that we don't, we as storytellers don't have to be afraid of our audiences and our audiences are demanding that we be braver and braver in telling stories that look like the world that they live in. Exactly. That's, that's the connection point right there. And, and we've done a ton of research and we're seeing that that is the universal message, right? That people want to see movies to connect with culture. Right. Well, also real life can be far more yeah. interesting yeah. what Hollywood can write. Look at Searching for Sugar Man. Yeah. Well, look, yeah, amazing. Just, yeah. To, just to plug Believe myself here. Um, <laughs> I, because I just, you can. Because I can. Uh, I just worked on a TV show, right, called Dr. Death. That is a true story that if it, if right. it were not true, you would never not believe, believe exactly. the no. story of this surgeon and, and go watch it tonight on Chorus. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but, but, uh, but um, you know, I mean, this is, you're absolutely right. Like the world that we live in, particularly the modern world that we live in, is, is way more complicated or complex than even the best imaginations ha have been able to, to put on screen. And we need to, we as storytellers, we as the people who are trying to like connect all of us humans together need to meet this moment. And we're starting to get there, but it, but you know, you guys have been doing it, but the rest of us need to catch up. And I'd love to tap in a bit more about him. You know, we, we're not messaging, we're not hammering a message. That's not, not uh, what the deal is because Warris, you have a very interesting story about a flight back from Mexico <laughs> and the way you handled that was so, um, um, so Warris. So interesting and respectful and, and had a purpose, but it was just, you could have chosen to um, be angry about it and you chose the small the smallest of screens to get that message out. Are, are you okay to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. I think we, we're all, you know, in before I jump into that, saying that same beautiful thing about it doesn't, that the whole hammering and the whole, the whole Trojan horse, it get that, we're we're tired of there's so many sad stories that's that is part of the human existence like we have to accept that like there are going to be sad there's going to be loss like no matter you know 
even at, at in, even if you just die of natural causes, that's still sad, right? Like that's still we're, we're still you lose a you lose a grandparent, it's still sad. But but this, but like learning to deal with it and and address it and discuss it in a way that um, that it is not the hammering on the head. And 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 in that in that same you know on that subject, uh, you know when I had gotten stuck and I I'm I wasn't I'm not. I don't love social media and what what it's done to the you know and I think that's a it's probably a different panel, but um, what it's done to the the world. But at the same time, I do have to say what what it can do is so impressive. Like it is just I you know they they didn't let me on the plane. They said you have to take your turban off. We have to check it. You know, uh, not sure for what, but they said they have to check it. And I'd gone through you know, multiple security, extra security, multiple, you know, all the scanners, all, you know, ev everything that they, they checked it by hand and everything. Um, and so, you know, it, it's for, for, a, for a sick, just removing your turban in the middle of a crowd isn't, it, you know, is akin to just sort of take, you know, take your clothes off right here. We want to, we, we, we want to uh, check you and sort of like, if you'd like to go into another room, I'm happy to, you know, i Big fan of security on planes. Big fan, um, but also a fan of my 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 civil rights, even even in another country. And so I just said, uh, yeah, that's that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. Um, and then they just simply they said, uh, you're not getting on the plane. And I, I was, I've been in that place before, and usually they just sort of go, okay, okay, that's that's fine, you know, like let's not bother. But this 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 was the first time where they were like. They put they put their foot down and like you're not getting on the plane and I was a little bit in shock. I was like, "What did this this actually really happen?" And and um, I used Instagram very you know the, the platform said that I wasn't let on the plane and uh, thirty minutes later thirty minutes later I was doing an interview with uh, Huffington Post and and that you know the uh, oddly enough the the lounge at the airline became the um, Became the headquarters for this. They were they they had. They tried to get you on a plane to go, and you were like, "No, I'm good." You know, it was very strange, and you know, I had I had the, you know, which I'm sure you know, people in this audience and people watching, whatever, you know, the S S S S stamped on it, and I was just like, "What is what does that mean? Like, why am I going through extra security every time? Like, it's it's not random." Um, and I'm, you know, and I'm tired of it. Like, it's just sort of like, I, I'm not willing to just accept it because I'm of a different color and I'm of a different religion that I have to abide by your fears or your insecurities or your inability to grasp the, um, the world at large. And so, um, you know, they came back to me with tickets, like, you know, not knowing what was, you know, not knowing about the press, but they came back to me with tickets and said, you can get on another airline, but you still have to go through that extra security and, and uh, you know, and I was like, well, that makes no sense. And, and I, I did have to get back to, and I think that's where, that's what people found funny is because I took that moment and I, it was right at the beginning of fashion week and I had dinners and shows to go to. And so I just, in my message, I wrote, sorry, fashion week, I'm going to be late um, because um, they're not <laughs> letting me on the plane. And it's that same I live by that. Like humor is how we deal with things, how we address things, how we get through with things. Humor, humor, and love, and that's what I kept doing in that um, in the in the lounge of the airline where they brought in a few phones for me to do interviews with CNN, and you know they, they, were, they were bringing me they were bringing me food from outside the airport. It, it was like it was it was hilarious, and um, I had intended I didn't think this was going to go you know past it now, now speaking to my lawyers and they were like what do you what do you want and I was like well I don't just want I, I don't want this to happen to to someone else and like that's sort of like I and I can stand I can I don't you know I, I'm, I'm fine I don't need to get on the plane it's it's a bummer it's it's annoying it's an it's an inconvenient but for someone else it might not be for someone else they might need to get back to their children or their job and they'll lose their job or whatever else and so it's like I I can I can take the hit I'll you know I'll be here for a few more hours it's okay you know, my, my favorite thing was the lawyer for the airline was in Texas and he was busy playing golf and he, you know, it was meta. He was like these, he, he, and his client was the airline and he was like, 
these Mexicans don't know what they're doing. Like he was racist towards the, like <laughs> oh. the whole yeah. situation. And he was, and, you know, he, yeah. he, was yeah. he was speaking with my lawyers and they were like, wait, what? Like, what? and they just took forever and not realizing it in this day and age, every hour is like a day or every hour you don't react is like a week in fact. And so, you know, I'm, you know, by, by the next morning I'm on, uh, Good Day New York and, you know, uh, Christiana Mapur at CNN and, and just saying that same message that it's that it's about that, that this change or this understanding will only come about through 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 love, love as action, love as um, as understanding. And and really this I go I go back to this thing of, you know, victimhood, because that and especially in terms of race or even even people with anxiety or people with disabilities or whatever you are you're always playing the victim and if you look at tv shows if you look at movies the perspective that's always being told the story that i have to tell is one of an immigrant guess what i don't want to tell that story i don't i i was i was punched in the face uh, after 9 11. it was in fact on uh, Spike Lee's, I haven't watched it yet, but it was I was on HBO, uh, Spike Lee's documentary about 9-11, which aired two days ago. That and But that's not my story to tell. I'm not living the story of a victimhood. I'm, I'm, I'm actually, as it turns out, oddly enough, I'm the hero of my own movie. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> and, you know, well, and, and and you know those stories like you you were very gracious and calm and you kind of had a methodology slightly whether it was intentional or not to deal with the situation but a lot of people uh, couldn't deal with that situation and I'm sure a lot of people saw you and and got triggered in different ways and Sheila I want to bring you back in here because you actually wrote a book about dealing with feelings um, based on some of the uh, projects that you were creating um, that were social impact so I'd love to hear about how that how people have been giving you feedback on that and how that came about yeah I learned in making angst that I have social anxiety um I am textbook and it was such a relief because I actually thought my whole life I was just broken and a little bit less than everybody. And so I had to wait till I was a fully fledged grown up to learn that I'm just social anxiety. And, um, but as a kid, I had learned all these little hacks to, to get through things. And turns out they're actually um, based in cognitive behavioral therapy, which is why they work. I had learned to hack my brain. And I would share that with people um, when I would do presentations or go to school screenings and people would say, oh my God, can you write all that down for me? I think that'll really help. Or can you, so I'd put it up online. I'd say, here, here, just, I'll, I'll send it to you. I had a little cut and paste thing. And then finally I was, nobody was like going online to get it. So um, people said, would you, could you like write a book or something? And I was just like, I'm not an author. I don't want to write a book. I don't have time to write a book, but I wrote a book. And um <laughs> and and it's I, I think it's really helpful and now schools are ordering the book and so now we're turning the work the book into a workbook and now we're turning it into an actual ed tech interactive um learning modules classroom learning modules and now turning it into corporate learning modules so it's it's all just an organic process and and really listening to people and what they want really hearing them and then creating creating tools and creating content for them to interact, which is all things that can move them forward. Like, let's not just talk about it. Like, that's exciting. But now then we got to keep moving. We got momentum. Let's go forward and let's focus on the things we can do. I think my, my sort of very idealistic uh, mission is to change the world within a minute of viewing. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned I something that. That, that I think hasn't been said enough yet is that, that, we can build these toolkits that come with these movies, right? So whether you're in a corporation or an education, or it's a call to action at the end of the film, like you want to learn about bullying, here's the website. Or with participant, a lot of their films, there's a call to action at the end. So, so yes, it's important to educate people, but it's also important to give them the path, right? Some people want to get involved. Some people want to take action. Some people want to make a donation, whatever, whatever the stance is, but, but ha having toolkits and, and a course of action, I think, is, is critical because, again, if you can leverage the power of film and TV and 
all these tools, you, you want to be able to help people, right? And people mm -hmm. want to be engaged. Yeah. That, yeah. That's the thing is that, that you're not having to lead the horse to water here. I mean, the audiences keep on telling us over and over and over again that they want to be to have an impact in their own lives, to have an impact in their communities, to, have, to feel more connected to the world around them. And so it's, I mean, you're doing it already, but it's incumbent upon us to do that. And, it, and I want to pick up on something that Wara said, because when we talk about filmmaking, like the, that hero of your own movie thing is really important. Yeah. Because where we point the lens tells us who the hero of our story is. And way, way, for way too long and way too often, the group of people who got centered in front of that lens was way too small. And... It, we are not in that world anymore. And it is incumbent upon us as storytellers, as people who want to be seeing good in the world, to broaden out that perspective, both in front of the camera, behind the camera, and recognize that I don't think for the, for the modern audience, you know, the kids who are coming up behind us, that that's intimidating in any way. No. It, re it reflects the world that they're already growing up in, right? and the world that we want to see them grow up into more. And so we, are, we would be failing the, our, our own audiences if we didn't expand what the lens is seeing, yeah. or re, not even expand it, recenter it into other places more often. Yeah, yeah. So I'd, like to, I'd just like to throw a question out to the panel um, because there's a lot of people here who want to go down this path. They want to start creating content that's meaningful to them. And um, I'd love to get your top tips on how they start doing that. I mean, John, I know you wrote a book about it. It has a it has a index in the back with a bunch of how-tos, but maybe you could just give us a few key no, points. I think one, one of the things that I talk a lot about, that the book I, I break down into different categories. So there's development, production, distribution, and then activation. And in the development part, I break down all these different paths, right? Where if, if you kind of know you want to do something around climate change, I mean, you could literally pick up, I don't know what the local newspaper is here. You open that up, there's probably 15 stories on, you know, on page one <laughs> that, that, that could become a story for a movie. So I think it, whether you're, whether you're interested in, in, you know, mental health or, or breastfeeding or, immigration or whatever the issue is, if you kind of know the category you're interested in, you can, you can find ways to research where there are stories to be told there, or you can, you can go to the, the, the bookstore or the library, right? There's tons of amazing, I read a book a few weeks ago that's, that's about climate change in the form of a narrative and how butterflies are migrating in a different place. And it was a beautifully told story that will be adapted into a movie at some point. So I think it's a question of whether you kind of know the category and you dig over there, or, you know, do you want to do a series? Do you want to do something that can be in schools? Or do you want to do something that'll play the festival circuit? So you kind of have to know what your goals are and the category, and then you start from there. That's, that's kind of how. And are you finding people, uh, Sheila, are, you, are they open to funding these types of projects? Like, you're, are you seeing a, a turn at all as far as... Is there raising money for these? Raising people? money? I think in my various uh, fundraising journeys, um, I find that money likes to know who the audience is and is the audience already there and engaged and wanting this? Because then I think they see opportunity for, and maybe it's not return necessarily on these kinds of films. But they want to know, is someone going to watch it? No, but they want to know if there's action, Impact. right? So if you do, if you do a yes. movie about climate change, it, can all, it could be less about how much money that movie makes. I mean, you obviously have to price it so you know you can make your money back. Um, but you can also go to the Sierra Club, right? You think about partnerships more with these kinds of movies because the Sierra Club, or if you're going to do a movie on senior citizens, which are, there are plenty now, right? You can go to any number of companies that that are speaking to that to that audience as partners, right? And brands are really we're, brands will will we're promote you. With, we're working with quite a few brands. We actually started with the brands showing our films in as screenings, ARP. then yeah. creating bigger programs for them to reach their entire employee base. And now they're coming back to us saying, can we make some movies about, you know, whether it's uh, kids being creative or various things that they're passionate about. So it's now starting to come full circle, but brands are getting involved. And I got to tell you, brands make some amazing content and it is not in the obvious way where it's, Patagonia is doing their brand. Patagonia, REI, Hilton, Marriott. I mean, it's. I cry watching these these movies. They're so good. 
but where do you watch them? Like, where do you go find them? So democracy. We're getting, we're getting, <laughs> <laughs> we're and Indie Flicks. Yeah, yeah, not only for democracy. Yeah. We're taking them out into the schools, yeah. but giving it to the schools for free. Right. And so uh, with some little kind of classroom discussion guide. Right. See, that's really important. Inspire creativity yeah. to positivity and you know, that kind but of thing. This is, this is a very important point because, you know, making a movie is a lot of work. But then when you're done, you're halfway yeah. Right. <laughs> there is this whole, Other as John chapter. said, activation phase. Yeah. And what are you doing with that movie? And Sheila, you mentioned brands and partnering with brands helps with activation, right? Because they their inherent interest is in reusing, repurposing, telling this again and again. And um, and this is such a huge thing. And I think you mentioned it, John, but I and. Uh, but I would kind of like to drive that point even even harder. When when you have a project, it's very important to um, to be able to tell your audience if you want to do something, what do you do? Mm -hmm. What do What's you the do? Call to action. Yeah. The yeah. CTA. And and even on the on the small scale, middle scale, and huge scale, mm -hmm. right? So it, if you just have a bit of time, what do you do? But if you want to become an activist in that area. Mm -hmm. Where do you go? And this is where education comes, right? Education as a package of the movie. Yeah. Well, a lot of these movies, to be honest, I don't know how many people in this room are already interested in the social impact space, but a lot of the movies we're talking about up here have websites. And instead of see movie about us, there's a take action. So a lot of these movies will have a website with support. So it will tell you how to, how to take action if you're interested in that mm -hmm. particular subject. I, I would say that the, a big failure of a movie is when somebody watches it and says, oh my God, the world is screwed up place. Yeah. <laughs> I cannot do anything, yeah. right? And yeah, we and this is an important point of that panel. We are all going to die. <laughs> but <laughs> that's before we what? do, right? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can we can still do some things. That's you know, it. you can also do things that are very simple. They don't have to be like big steps. We did a film called Like, which is all about, you know, uh, social media's role in our lives. And number one thing that people liked was uh, the tips piece where they turned their phone to grayscale. Mm -hmm. They stopped using their phone as an alarm clock. And they turned off notifications from, you know, like, Tinder and uh, Zappos and flash sales and just kept only notifications on from human beings. So your phone is not interrupting you as much. Mm -hmm. and that's been our huge feedback for that's us. That's amazing. Hmm. That's cool. Um, Cause you know, when you use your phone as an alarm clock and the first thing you look at is all those bright colors, mm -hmm. your brain lights up yeah. and that's the most interesting thing in is in your palm of your hand, as opposed to even the person next to you. Yeah. yeah. So it's, there's a great it's social educated. impact movie about that on Netflix right now. I know, but you know what? Social dilemma. Is that it's a little called? depressing. Yeah, it's depressing. It is, it's, it's, but it's, it doesn't. It doesn't leave you feeling good. You don't, you don't yeah. feel good, but it does teach fear. you a lot. Yeah. Also, Absolutely. a bit heavy-handed. So I hope yours is better. <laughs> Mine is <Yeah>. light, <laughs> filled with hope. Awesome. Um, do we have any questions? Maybe we should throw it out to the audience here. Anybody have anything? Questions, comments? A topic for a movie you want to make? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, the guys in the middle. Where can I buy that? Uh, you, can buy that, you can buy that book on Amazon.com. Yeah. Say the title again. Filmmaking, Don't filmmaking for change. change. I, I tell you what, I'll give you a copy of this book because I happen to have one in my hand. <laughs> if you're the first person that asks, I'll let you have it. And, and I'll, can uh, I? But add, it is, but it is available everywhere. It's yeah. at Barnes and Noble and Amazon and everywhere. Else. And it's the second edition, right? Second, second edition. Yeah. Yeah. The first one had a had a polar bear on a on a ice cap that was melting. We've so moved on. This is a little stronger cover, I think, but that's given action. Thank you. Yeah. And you can buy my book on <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's on Amazon as well. It's called The Creative Coping Toolkit, and it teaches us all how to kind of gamify talking about our feelings so that we can open up the conversation around mental health. What's the, name of that book? the Creative Coping Toolkit. Creative Coping Toolkit. Josh's show is on. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> we're going to need that for that show. Yeah. <laughs> and we can watch this again on Filmocracy. Excellent. Yeah. Right? Paul. Where do you see the future of social impact filmmaking in the next five, ten years? Oh, Lord. It's going to go way up because I think what everybody up here is saying is that, is that 
most importantly, audiences have, have started asking for this. And, I, and as much as I'm not a huge fan of Netflix, for example, I have to say they, they did with documentary kind of usher in this new audience that never watched documentary before. I mean, people used to think documentary was talking heads and for snooze fest education. Now we're, now we're seeing amazing documentaries and, and narratives with, with social impact. And I think when the audience is asking for it, it's kind of our job as filmmakers to kind of give and distributors to give them what they want and what better job could you have to, to make movies that can change the world? I mean, and I think COVID has proven that, that this edutainment that's coming out is everybody wants it. I mean, everybody's tapped into it and, and, and the analytics are saying are just through the roof. So we're, we're seeing people wanting this type of content. Yeah. And I was just say one more thing real quick is that, the, the other thing that's really, really important is that we were talking about the financing panel earlier. Sometimes it's hard to raise money. But the truth is, especially if you're interested in documentary where it's a short or a feature, you can make these documentaries for next to nothing. I've, I've done six now. And the average cost has been less than $100,000. And that's not a lot of money to make a feature-length documentary that can really make a difference in somebody's life. Can I also add... No offense, Walrus and, and Josh, but you can make these films and you don't need uh, an A-list actor or a big name. <laughs> um, but, it, but it is better. <laughs> Much better. Much One better. little caveat. The thing is, like, we have Michael Phelps in one of our films and the press wouldn't cover us unless they talked to him only. Oh, wow. So we kept pushing our launch and pushing our launch because he was doing sponsorships and couldn't talk about it. So we waited two months and then suddenly we were coming into November and school had started. And while still schools weren't necessarily wanting to book it, we needed that press and he wasn't available to talk about it. And the show GMA and today didn't want to cover us wow. unless they had him. Oh, yes. So it was a little double-edged sword. Um, double -edged sword. I ended up going to the Today Show because I heard he was going to be there talking about turning off the water when you're brushing your teeth for Colgate. And so I went and had a friend there, got myself in the audience, ran into him in the green room and said, hi. And then um, he saw me there. So they said, so you're a big advocate of mental health. He goes, yeah, in fact, uh, yeah, I was in a movie and <laughs> he snuck it in, which was awesome. Oh, good. Thank you, Michael. That in. That's but cool. um, no, it was really challenging. And those that, who knew that was so going to happen? So you're saying that celebrity does not always make something better? <laughs> not in the social impact documentary March space. of the Penguins, right? Yeah. March All of I was... the Penguins was a French film, and then Morgan Freeman came in there. Oh, right, yeah. His, well, his or, voice, yeah. yeah. Uh, Leo DiCap Leonardo yeah, DiCaprio yeah. with water. But I think the thing is, when you're filming and you've got someone famous, get all the stuff you can up front on film so you have it for later to to release during the release cycle. Like collect your marketing assets in the process of making your film as well. And you know what's really great is when you have famous people who are willing to share and tweet and, and post and make a comment on your film. That carries so much weight. Yeah. Yes. I forgot to ask one question. Um, uh, during the COVID, I guess everybody binged and watched a lot of movies. Mm -hmm. right? And uh, in February, we had our annual meeting with um, the, the, well, the rest of the world. And what we, what the data that I was able to research was that people watch so much co-op film and content on the mobile devices all over that they have a higher sense of quality. The quality demand is really on high, super high, and they're very intuitive. What do you think, how are we going to be able to keep the quality at that level? Because we're at a high level right now. How do we... You know, maintain and sustain mm -hmm. that high quality demand that's going to be required from the audience. It's a, it's a, it's a question of how you define quality. I yeah, guess, right? I, I, I mean tech I mean, quality or production. Well, production. You mean you mean, you mean from like a production, production value? Yeah. The, 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 the quality of film. You know, everything was so good across the point. The story was good. Everything was. I mean, people want so much in there. So new quality. I think. I think. It's a little bit off topic for this panel, but but it's but that's okay. It's I think the answer to that question is that two two opposite things are meeting in the middle, which is that the um, the the cost of high quality production is actually coming down. The tools that are available to people who want yeah. to tell stories have become significantly less expensive over time, 
and the broad knowledge of filmmaking is spread wider and wider and wider. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that we all know that the industry has not been very good about empowering certain voices over time. So there, ha there has always been a bottleneck of, we tell this many stories, but we have this many storytellers. So there's plenty of talent left to tell their stories. And the cost of, of telling those stories has come down like really radically. We were up here yesterday talking about it was inconceivable to have aliens or expo explosions in an independent film even five years ago, right? Or when did Disc Nine come out? Ten years ago now? Yeah. Something like that? Okay, so Disc Nine is an independent film yeah. and has world-class effects in it, yeah. wisely tells a story which, you know, keeps those things sort of in their place in the background and, and is very artful in the way that it does it. But that was there's no way in 1996 that you were going to be able to get that kind of production value for that budget and have that and have the quality end up that way and it and that's the same for all stories so that's the social impact movie the documentary the tv show it doesn't matter like the tools are becoming more readily available and the audience keeps on telling us like it doesn't just have to be this small group of people who tells the story we're interested in seeing a broader base of of storytelling yeah, and I think just to add to that, the, the idea of, of quality is a, is a bit of a gray area, I think, because you, you look at the documentaries from last year, for example, Time, right, was one of the Oscar candidates. It was basically this woman's hundreds of hours of home movies, right? And her husband was incarcerated, and, and it became one of the best movies of the year, and it was made by really strong editing of, of a brilliant story that was all home video footage and, and a few interviews, but not super high production value. Brilliant storytelling. Mm -hmm. And then Tangerine was made on an iPhone. iPhone. Yeah, right. Let's talk about the quality in general. What is the, what is the, not just the, the, the look of it, but just quality of engagement? No, I think, the, but, but the point is, is you can. Writing. The, the, yeah, it's the storytelling and it's, it's having the right story to tell. And if it's a good story and it's engaging and inspiring, people are going to watch it, whether it's made for $100,000 or $5 million or on an iPhone or with home movies. I, I think it's. We're seeing, to Josh's point, a, 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 an, a, an amazing amount of storytellers coming out of the woodwork, and all these devices and all the technology, you can do you can do a lot of it in your garage. Yeah, well, I mean, your, your average TikToker has a very advanced understanding of modern editing, right? <laughs> like the, the 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 language of timing, film and, yeah, is is just very broadly spread out across the populace. It's not such a hyper specialized thing anymore. Sorry, Miss, I, I cut you off. Okay, sorry. Yeah. So I just want to thank uh, everyone and you know, the whole team for the whole team for your special panel. And I wanted to echo on that. You don't really need a huge budget. It's never a huge budget. But if you have the mindset, the passion, the dedication, and meeting the right people, you can truly make things happen. Hallelujah. And huge social impact. And just very quickly, I wanted to share that um, um, we actually completed the course for Corona, Corona Music called Corona TV. And it finished right before the pandemic started. We didn't uh -huh. have a big budget. It was ultra low budget. We did it in two days, uh, 70 takes. Like, wow. no, no cut. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> and we finished it, and it was intense. And what is the messaging? The messaging is a thriller, dramatic thriller movie, but at the same time, the real message is anti-racism, anti-racism, anti-xenophobia. So, so that's why I you know, strongly encourage, if you have the thought, the idea, connected, meet people. This is where I feel like I'm at home right now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then you might even happen. It's part of the things about the pandemic that I really realize and recognize and you know, have gratitude for is that you know, we were taking things for granted, taking things for granted, and things happen, and you know, you know, things happen, and 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 things
tell people where they can 